Hello, this is Chef John from foodwishes.com with lasagna. That's right, I'm finally making lasagna. It's been requested so many times. And because it's such a popular Italian-American holiday tradition, I thought this would be the perfect time to do it. So for me, there are two keys to a great lasagna, a fantastic meat sauce, and a great cheese filling. So first things first. So for the meat sauce, I'm going to take some Italian sausage and ground beef. We're going to put that over medium heat. And while it's browning, we're going to break it up into as small a pieces as possible. While that's browning, I'm going to take some mushrooms and give them a really rough chop. Okay, don't worry about them all being the same size. Those are going to break down in the sauce anyway. So I'm going to add those to my browning meat. All right, go ahead and stir those in. I'm also going to add some salt, some black pepper, and some red chili flakes. Okay, so at this point, I want you to turn the heat to medium high and cook it until the meat's browned and any liquid that came out of the mushrooms has evaporated. So you see this, the meat's browned and the bottom of the pan is pretty much dry. And at that point, we're gonna add our prepared marinara sauce. Am I using homemade? Well, I'm not at liberty to say, but you can use just about anything here. Homemade, jarred sauce, as long as it's good quality, not a problem, all right? You saw me add a splash of water there. If you're using jarred sauce, make sure you rinse the jars with water. And then we're going to bring that to a simmer, turn it down to low, and simmer for hours. How long exactly? I don't know. It should simmer until the meat is extremely, extremely tender. All right, I did mine about two hours. You want to make sure you add a little more water along the way if it's getting too thick. And once it's done and you're happy with the texture, turn it off, taste for salt and pepper, and set it aside. All right, so that's half the battle. Our beautiful meat sauce is ready. On to the cheese filling, which is simply a couple beaten eggs, some ricotta cheese, and not that skim milk stuff, the real whole milk variety. For this recipe, you just need the highest quality cheeses possible. Will people know? I don't care. I will know, and you will know. So after that, we're gonna add our Reggiano Parmesan and fresh mozzarella. Now you notice how it's diced and not grated? You shouldn't be able to grate good, soft, fresh mozzarella. In fact, there's an old saying, if you can use a grater, you should be a hater. All right, so use that nice, fresh, soft mozzarella. They have it in stores now, use it. We're also gonna add some salt and pepper and cayenne. And then last but not least, some fresh Italian parsley and give that a good mix. So like I said earlier, if you have a great meat sauce and a really great cheese filling, you are going to have a fantastic lasagna. There's no way not to. So before we can assemble this, of course we have to boil one box, one pound lasagna noodles. All right, make sure you're using salted water. Now this is the only time ever, except for maybe pasta salad, where I'm gonna tell you when the pasta's cooked, drain it, rinse it, and keep it in cold water. All right, so you see that here? My noodles are ready, and it's time for final assembly. And yes, in case you're wondering, I have tried using the raw noodles, not boiling them first. I don't like that method. All right, let's talk about the pan. This is not something that goes in your wimpy little 9 by 13 casserole dish. This needs a lasagna pan. 10 by 15 by like 3 inches deep is perfect. All right, so get yourself a nice lasagna pan. Now, assembly is super easy if you can do some simple math. Divide your sauce into four parts your noodles into three parts, and your cheese into two parts. So one-fourth of the sauce goes down. On top of that, one-third of the noodles. All right, I had 18 noodles, so I used six. Okay, so once the first third of the noodles are down, the base of our lasagna is done, and we're ready for the first half of the cheese mixture. All right, so divide that perfectly in half, spread that cheese mixture out onto the noodles, and then top with another portion of the meat sauce. All right, so once that's spread nice and even, we are going to take the second third of our noodles, place those over, and as long as it's covered, you're good. Don't worry about what it looks like. Don't worry if you got a couple broken ones. It's all good when it bakes. So the second layer of noodles are down. The last of the cheese mixture gets spread on there. I don't know about you, but I'm getting kind of excited. On top of the cheese, just like our last layer, goes the meat sauce. At this point, we're going to give it a little shake to settle it. And yes, the old tapa tapa. And to finish this beauty off, the last of the noodles go over the top. You can see the end there. I just pieced together some of the smaller broken pieces. Doesn't matter. Relax. Once this cooks, it all looks fantastic. All right, over that goes the last fourth of the meat sauce. Spread that over. Make sure all the noodles are covered. I'm going to dot that with more fresh mozzarella. We're going to finish with some more grated Parmesan cheese. Cover it loosely with foil. I don't want the foil touching the cheese, but I do want it covered. I'm going to put it on a sheet pan in case I have any spillover. 
I'm going to put that in a 375 degree oven for 30 minutes. At that point, take off the foil, continue cooking for about another 30-35 minutes until it's done. And when it's done, it will be golden brown, it will be bubbling, and it will be hot all the way through. What a gorgeous, gorgeous lasagna, if I do say so myself. And I know you can't wait to tear into this, but let it sit for at least 20 minutes. It's just going to be too hot to enjoy unless you do. All right, but after that, all bets are off. Cut it into nice squares. You'll get like 12 decent portions out of this or like nine huge ones. You can see all those beautiful layers, that super meaty sauce with the sausage and the beef and the mushrooms adding a little bit of extra something, the beautiful cheeses. So, so delicious. So whether you're serving this for your Italian American Christmas dinner or just any time, I hope you give this recipe a try. So go to the site, all the ingredients are there for the sauce, for the filling, for the whole thing. And as always, enjoy. Today I'm going to show you spaghetti aglio olio, which is the most popular pasta dish in Italy by far. And all spaghetti aglio olio means is spaghetti with garlic and oil. So we're going to start by slicing thin six cloves of garlic. Now we're not mincing, we're not chopping, we want to slice it just like that. Very specific cut for this dish. And there's my prepped garlic. I'm also going to chop about a quarter cup of fresh Italian parsley. And then the other ingredients are really good olive oil and a really good Reggiano Parmesan, the real stuff. We're going to add our olive oil and our garlic to a cold saute pan. Turn the heat to medium and we're going to slowly toast that garlic. Now the beauty of this dish is while the garlic's toasting, we're going to cook the pasta. The sauce and the pasta take about the same amount of time. So make sure you're doing these two things right next to each other. So our pasta is boiling, our garlic is in the pan. As soon as it starts to bubble, turn the heat down to medium low, and then we're just going to watch this slowly toast. Okay, don't walk away. This is only going to take about five minutes. The garlic should just be barely bubbling like that, and we want to slowly, slowly toast that to a beautiful golden brown. So basically what we're trying to do is infuse as much of that toasted garlic flavor into the olive oil without getting it too dark or bitter. See that? That's just about where you want to be, okay? As soon as that gets to that stage, we're going to quickly turn off the heat and add a half a ladle, about a half a cup of our boiling pasta water. And even though we turned off the heat, you need that water in there to stop the browning process because that's perfect right there. And by now our pasta is cooked and we're gonna drain our spaghetti. We're not gonna rinse our spaghetti. Do not rinse your spaghetti. Never rinse your spaghetti. Please do not rinse your spaghetti. All right, we're gonna dump that into our pasta bowl. We're gonna add some black pepper, red pepper flakes, and salt to taste. At that point, we're gonna pour over that unbelievable garlic oil. If you could smell this, you'd be like, man, that smells good, or something to that effect. And there you can see all our slices of garlic. So while there's a ton of garlic in this, it's actually pretty mild because of how we slowly toasted that in the oil, okay? So don't be afraid. All right, we're going to dump over about two-thirds of the cheese. Of course, all the amounts will be on food wishes, as always. We're going to dump over our Italian parsley, and then we're going to toss and serve. So after it's all mixed up really well, I'm going to bring it to the table, topped with the rest of the cheese, and that's it. Classic, or at least what I think is classic, spaghetti. Aliolia, spaghetti with garlic and oil. Ironically, had I shot this video before I got the cold that caused the laryngitis, I wouldn't have the laryngitis. Because as you know, garlic is like a superfood that prevents almost everything. So not only does this taste fantastic, it's just really, really good for you, body, mind, and spirit. So I hope you give this a try. Once again, I apologize for the voice, but like I said, the show must go on. All the ingredients are on the site, so go check it out. And as always, enjoy. Creamy tomato tuna penne pasta. That's right, super easy, delicious, healthy pasta dish, which is a very popular food wish, based on one of my favorite lunch specials of all time, the tuna melt with a cup of cream of tomato soup. So delicious. So here we go. Now, if you can swing it, you want to use this. Tuna packed in olive oil. I'm using tonino. Some of you may know I want a year's supply, so of course I'm going to use this. This one is packed in olive oil with oregano, and you can see that beautiful hand-packed 
pieces of tuna with the olive oil. This is the best for this kind of a pasta. If you can't find that, use regular tuna and a couple tablespoons of olive oil, pinch of dry oregano. It'll still work. But you can find this at the nice stores. And if they don't have this brand, any tuna packed in olive oil should work. I'm going to dump that into a saucepan over medium low heat. I'm also going to toss in a little bit of anchovy, either filet or paste. All right, we're going to need a little salt in this anyway. I'd rather use the anchovy, or as we call it around here, Italian MSG. A giant pinch of red pepper flakes, because I like it spicy. A good amount of crushed garlic, two or three cloves. We're going to break that up, and I want to saute that in the olive oil the tuna came in for about a minute. But I don't want to start counting that minute until I see it sizzling. Okay, see that? When you see the oil bubbling a little bit and that garlic starts to kind of sizzle just a hair, give it about a minute. You don't want to color it. You don't want to brown it. We just want to wake up the flavors, take that raw edge off. At that point, after a minute, I'm going to add cream of tomato soup. I know, you can't believe it, can you? And I'm not using the concentrate out of that white and red can. This is a carton of high-quality, organic, low-sodium, all-natural cream of tomato soup. All right, again, the same nice story you got the tuna in, they will have those cartons of tomato soup. And you'll also see me throw in a little bit of water there, about a half cup I used to rinse out the tuna jar. All right, we're going to give that a stir. I'm going to turn the heat up to medium, and I want to bring this to a simmer. And I want to simmer it for about 10 minutes, which, coincidentally, is about how long it's going to take to cook your penne pasta. So bring it to a simmer. You don't want it boiling, but you want a little bubbling going on. All right. In the meantime, we're going to bring a large salted pot of water to a rapid boil. We're going to cook our penne pasta about a minute and a half to two minutes less than the package directions. Because this is a very light, thin type sauce, we want the pasta to absorb this at the end. By the way, why is there a red pepper flake floating? Because I don't use a different spoon to stir the pasta that I use for the sauce. Why do I want to wash two spoons? All right, when the pasta is cooked, we're going to drain it really, really well, put it back into the dry pot. I'm going to add about a tablespoon of chopped fresh tarragon, a fantastic herb for seafood pastas. Really sweetens things up, super nice. I'm going to pour in my hot sauce, a handful, about a half a cup of finely, finely, finely grated real Parmesan. If you're using that crap from the store that's already pre-graded, the fake waxy stuff, don't even bother. Don't make me do a grating demo. So we're going to stir all that together quickly. We're going to pop the lid back on for like two minutes and let the heat, the residual heat in that pasta. We did not rinse it. We never rinse our pasta. So the pasta is still very hot. It's going to absorb that beautifully light, sweet, aromatic tomato sauce. All right, after two minutes, we're going to uncover it. We're going to give it another stir because the stuff at the bottom, you know, is absorbing a little quicker than the stuff at the top. So you want to mix that well. Put the lid back on for one minute, and then you're pretty much ready to eat. All right, taste for salt and pepper. Should be fine. Let me take a look here. Oh, yeah. Look at that. Like I said, a really light, light, but still very satisfying, rich tasting sauce. By the way, if you're like, hey, I heard you can't put cheese and pasta and seafood together. Read the blog post. Read the blog post. I prove once and for all that that is BS. Pardon my language. We're going to spoon that up. Such a great, just delicious, super fast, super easy. 15 minutes start to finish. You got a beautiful lunch or dinner. Some more grated Parmesan. Throw a few more pepper flakes on there. So, so good. Look at that. I'm going to dig in. So believe it or not, cream of tomato soup used as a pasta sauce. Like I said, this was inspired by one of my favorite lunch specials of all time, tuna melt with a cup of cream of tomato soup. I love that lunch. Whenever I'm at a diner, I look for that. Such a classic combination. And this is kind of a take on that in pasta form. Anyway, I really hope you give that a try. All the ingredients are on the site, as usual. And as always, enjoy. The best baked ziti. That's right, I am half Italian and was raised eating the finest Italian American cuisine. And I filmed almost 2,000 recipe videos. So when you consider all those facts, it seems incredible that I've never posted a recipe for baked ziti. But hey, better late than never. And hopefully I make up for that long wait by posting what I think is the best version out there. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a pound and a half of Italian sausage. 
And for this, you can use the hot or the mild, or as I'm about to do, use half of each. And before we brown this up, we're going to have to remove the casing, which is done very simply by making a cut down the length, at which point we'll go ahead and simply peel that off. So I went ahead and did that to the other three, and then headed to the stove, where I have a sauce pot placed over high heat with a little bit of olive oil in it. And we'll transfer our sausage in along with one large diced yellow onion. And what we'll do here is cook this stirring, crumbling and breaking up that meat as we do, until our onions soften and turn translucent, and our pieces of meat start to brown up nicely. Which is going to take you a few minutes, so don't be in a hurry. And what we'll do when we think we're getting close to sautéing that long enough, is go ahead and toss in a few dry herbs, specifically some dry oregano, some dried thyme, and some dried rosemary. And we'll go ahead and stir that in and cook it for another minute or so, at which point we're going to add not one, but two full jars of marinara sauce, which is about six cups total. But wait, there's more. Once we dump those in, we'll rinse each of those jars out with about a cup of water, and we will add that as well and stir everything together. And then while still on high heat, we'll wait for this to come up to a simmer. And when it does, and it's looking a little something like this, we'll go ahead and give it a stir, and then back our heat down to medium low. And then we'll just let this simmer gently for about an hour or so, stirring occasionally. At which point, assuming we're happy with how it tastes, it's ready to use. And by the way, once this is simmered, or during the simmering process, if you want to skim some of that fat off the top, that's not a bad idea. And I usually do, and probably should have here, but for whatever reason this time, it didn't look like I had that much, so I just went ahead and stirred it in. And that's it, once our sauce is done, we'll simply set that aside and move on to cooking our ziti, which as usual, we'll be doing in some very, very well salted water. All right, the water should literally taste like the ocean. And if you've never been to the ocean, trust me, that water is pretty salty. And what we'll do is give that a good stir, and then cook it, but a couple minutes under the package directions. Okay, we do want this a hair underdone, since it is going to continue to cook once it's in the oven with the sauce. So if the package says 10 minutes, I would do it for 8. Or whatever you think it's going to take to make this slightly undercooked. And then what we'll do is go ahead and drain that very well. And then we'll transfer that into a large bowl. And then we will carefully add our sauce. Which I didn't do. I just went ahead and dumped it in and it basically splashed everything. Except by some miracle, not the lens. And then what we'll want to do is take a big spoon or spatula and give this a very thorough stirring. And that's because it's a proven scientific fact that tubes like nothing more than to be filled with stuff. So as we stir this, all that amazingly flavorful sauce is going to be pulled into that pasta. Which, by the way, is why I use about 50% more sauce than most of the recipes call for. Right, the only thing worse than no-bake ziti is a dry-bake ziti. But anyway, we'll go ahead and give that a good stir. And then I like to let it rest for about five minutes or so. And while that's hanging out getting good, we can go ahead and generously olive oil a large casserole dish. At which point it's time to move on to final assembly. And what we'll do first is go ahead and transfer in exactly half of our pasta sauce mixture. And for that, I'm going to use one of these round wire strainers. And I guess we could just go ahead and dump half in and spread it out. But my theory is by using this, some of that sauce is going to drip through, which means my top layer of pasta is going to be a little saucier than the bottom layer which because of a little thing called gravity, I think works out better and prevents our top from getting too dry. But no matter what you use, once half of it's been transferred in, it is time to add a layer of cheese. And we're going to be using three of them, starting with a beautiful basket ricotta. And we'll go ahead and dollop exactly half of that over the top. And then we'll give that just a little bit of a spread. Okay, not too much, but a little bit. And then next up, we will scatter exactly half of our mozzarella over the top. And as you can probably see, I cut that into small cubes instead of grating it, which I think texturally works out a lot better. Not to mention, depending on the moisture content, mozzarella can be kind of tricky to grate. And then once half our mozzarella has been scattered over, we will finish up this layer with a very generous grating of Parmesan cheese, or if you want pecorino, which is what I'm using today. And that's it, layer one is done. And we can move on to our second and final layer. And the second verse is same as the first. We'll go ahead and transfer over the rest of our pasta and sauce. And again, you could probably just gently dump it over and spread it. But I like to be a little bit careful, because I don't want to mess up that beautiful cheese layer we just created. And because of the tool I was using, this layer was definitely a little saucier. And yes, I could be overthinking that step. But since this comes out so amazingly well, maybe not. But anyway, I finished up by giving that the old shake-a-shake-a. At which point, we can go ahead and place on the rest of our cheese. 
Only this time, because it's the top layer, we are not going to spread our ricotta. We're going to leave it in nice dollops like that. And then just like the first layer, we'll finish up with our mozzarella and pecorino. Or parmesan. Like I said, both will work. So you decide. I mean, you are after all the iced tea of your big ZD. But no matter what you use, just make sure you don't use that stuff already grated out of the package and that you grate it yourself. Otherwise, you just played yourself. And that's it. Once the rest of our cheese has been applied over the top, we'll go ahead and clean up those edges a little bit before transferring this into the center of a 375 degree oven for about 30 to 35 minutes or until our casserole is piping hot and the cheese is beautifully melted and just barely starting to get golden brown. Okay, so that looks just about perfect. And we really don't want to go any longer than that since everything in here is cooked and really all we're doing is heating everything through. And yes, if you have to, you could serve this immediately, but I think it's going to be much better if you let it rest for about 10 to 15 minutes. And while we're waiting, we can go ahead and garnish with the obligatory chopped Italian parsley, which of course is a mandatory requirement for any and all Italian American casserole type dishes. And that's it. Once our baked ziti has rested and been parsleyed, we can go ahead and serve that up, which I'll do by cutting out a nice large portion with this spoon. Okay, this pan should easily serve eight, although I think I just took about a sixth of it. And man, was that looking and smelling good. So I quickly tossed over another pinch of parsley. And then I grabbed a fork and dug right in. And as I touched on earlier, one of my main complaints with a lot of big Z recipes is they're just too dry, which is absolutely not the case with this version. Okay, our strategy of using extra sauce, not to mention extra sausage and cheese, really worked out well. And I could not have been happier with how this came out. Oh, except possibly for one thing. As I mentioned, I should probably have skimmed some of that fat off the top of the sauce. Since with all that meat and cheese involved, we have plenty of fat to go around. But anyway, that's it. How I like to make baked ziti. Okay, I'm not saying we should stop making lasagna, but when it comes to meaty, cheesy, saucy, pasta-based casseroles, baked ziti, especially this version, is very, very tough to beat. Speaking of which, in the Italian-American community, this is a very popular dish for potlucks. And if you go to one of those, there is a 100% chance someone will bring a pan of this, and probably a 90% chance more than one person brings it. And if you bring this, and they bring basically any other version, you will win by a lot. And if you're thinking it's not a competition, why can't we just enjoy both? Well, it is, and we can't. But whether you're going to make this to crush the competition at a potluck dinner, or you're just looking for something delicious to whip up to eat during that Sopranos marathon, either way, I really do hope you give this a try soon. So please follow the links below for the ingredient amounts, a printable written recipe, and much more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Pasta alla Genovese. That's right, I'm going to show you my take on this incredibly delicious meat sauce, whose name translates to in the style of Genoa. Which is kind of interesting, since as far as I can tell, this was actually invented in Naples, where it's become one of that city's most popular dishes. But anyway, other than that, the name is totally accurate. And no matter what you call it, is one of the most delicious meat sauces you will ever taste. Not to mention incredibly simple. And I said simple, not fast. But we'll get to that. Let's start off with the simple part. And here are the three major components to this sauce. So what we're going to need is some kind of cured pork, either salt pork or pancetta. And yes, you could use bacon, but that's smoked. And I don't like this smoky. And then besides that, we're also going to need a couple pounds of beef chuck, cut into about two inch pieces. And then last but not least, we need some onions, and a lot of them as in five or six pounds of onions. In the business, we call that a ton of onion. And not only are these three things the main ingredients, they're almost the only ingredients. And how we'll start this is by transferring our pancetta or salt pork into a pot containing some olive oil. And we will set that over medium heat. And what we're gonna do here is cook that stirring until it kind of browns up a little bit. And most of that delicious fat has rendered out. So we will go ahead and cook that, like I said, on medium heat until we get it to just about this point. And once that's been accomplished, we'll use a strainer or some kind of slotted spoon. And we'll go ahead and transfer that into a bowl and, of course, reserve it till needed. And if everything's gone according to plan, we should be left with three or four tablespoons of beautiful rendered pork fat in which we will now brown our chunks of beef. So what we'll do at this point is go ahead and crank our heat up to high and we will transfer our chunks of beef in. And there are two ways you can do this. You could brown this meat in like four or five small batches or you can use my method, which is much faster, much easier, and classically completely wrong. But it works great, and here's how you do it. Instead of batches, we add all the beef in at once, and we season it with salt, 
And what's going to happen is this sits on high heat. A lot of liquid's going to come out of that beef, and it's going to start to boil in its own juices, which is not even close to what we want when we talk about browning the meat. But fear not, because what's going to happen over the course of the next, I don't know, 10 or 15 minutes, is that those juices are going to evaporate over that high heat, eventually leaving us with nothing but the meat and the fat. And as soon as all that moisture is boiled off, the meat's going to brown up beautifully. Check it out. And then once that's happened, what we'll do is reduce our heat down a little bit to medium high. And we'll go ahead and dump in our diced carrots and celery, as well as our reserved cooked pancetta. And I'm also going to give it a little bit of freshly ground black pepper and another very generous pinch of salt. And we will stir all that together and cook it for about five minutes. And during that time, those veggies are going to soften up and sweeten up a little bit. And of course, our chunks of beef will continue to brown. And after, like I said, about five minutes on medium high, our mixture should look something like this. And at that point, we can stop and add the rest of the ingredients, which includes a small squirt of tomato paste, as well as exactly one bay leaf, and a nice splash of white wine. And as you well know, anytime we brown meats in a pot and add liquid, it's going to deglaze the bottom, which is the whole purpose of this step. And by the way, I should mention that this sauce predates the existence of tomatoes in Italy. So traditionally, there are no tomatoes used in this sauce. But having said that, I do like to add a little touch of tomato paste for a little extra flavor and acidity, not to mention it really improves the color, I think. But that's up to you. You are the boss of this virtually unknown meat sauce. But anyway, we're going to cook that stirring for a couple minutes until the bottom's deglazed, at which point we can stop and add our massive amount of sliced onions. Which, please, tell me you've been slicing one or two at a time while the meat was browning. Because that's just smart time management. And as you can see, I'm using a combo of red and yellow onion. But any combination will work. And how we're going to prep these, besides peeling them and cutting them in half, is to make two cuts this way before slicing across as usual. And please do not waste time trying to be super accurate, as these onions are pretty much going to cook down to nothing. And as far as a tip, by far the easiest way to cut five or six pounds of onions at once is to not cut them at once. Okay, so what you want to do is have these near the cutting board, and while you're cooking your pork or browning your beef, every once in a while you walk over and cut an onion up. So yes, that is a ton of onions to slice. But if you space that work out while your meat's cooking, it's not that bad. And then once those are set, we can go ahead and add those to the pot. And as you're about to see, mine just barely fit. And hopefully yours do too, but if they don't, don't worry. Just reserve the onions you can't fit in, and we'll put those in when this cooks down a little. No problem. So we will add, push, and press our onions in. And then what we want to do is turn the heat down to medium, cover that tightly, and let it cook for 30 minutes without touching it. Just let it sit there a half hour at which point we'll come back over, uncover it, and give it a stir. And you will certainly notice those onions will have softened up and kind of collapsed down into the pot. And what we're going to want to do after giving this a very thorough and thoughtful mixing is cover it back up and give it another 30 minutes covered. At which point I'm guessing it should look something remotely similar to this. And we will give that another stir to see where we're at. And as I'm stirring this, I'm sure a few of you are thinking, hey, this has cooked an hour. I bet this is pretty close to being done. Well, not exactly, because what we're going to do at this point is reduce our heat too low and simmer this, stirring occasionally for about 8 to 10 hours. And no, I'm not kidding. And during that cooking time, you really don't have to do too much except give it an occasional stir, as well as skim any excess fat that comes to the top. And other than keeping an eye on the liquid level, that's pretty much it. Just let it simmer for 8 to 10 hours or until it's done. And usually with this kind of thing, done means the meat is fork tender, but not here. Oh, that's not good enough. This stuff has to simmer and simmer and simmer until the beef and onions kind of melt into each other and become one. And don't worry, that only sounds deep. That just means we're going to cook this mixture until we can't tell the beef from the onions. We want to cook this until the onions and meat break down so thoroughly they become one substance. And after simmering that long, you can probably pretty much tell just by looking at it that it's ready. But of course, you're going to test your work by actually eating some. So I gave mine a little taste. And it was, if I'm being honest, spectacularly delicious. But it did need a little touch of salt, so I added some of that. And once we've determined our sauce is cooked long enough, and we've tested for seasoning, our Genovese meat sauce is done and ready to use. And the amount of sauce this recipe makes is going to be enough for about two pounds of rigatoni. And if I was making that much, I would just boil two pounds and mix this all together, but I'm not. So what I do is make this ahead, and then just heat it up in a pan when you're ready to use it. So that's what you see me doing here. We'll heat up a couple ladles of sauce, to which we will add our slightly undercooked rigatoni, along with a pinch of fresh marjoram, as well as a shake of cayenne. By the way, that was for the ladies. 
And what we'll do, as usual, is finish cooking that pasta for the last minute in the sauce so it soaks in some of those beautiful meaty flavors. And by the way, as usual, if you need to thin the sauce out a little bit, you could add a splash of pasta water. That's you cooking. And then to finish, once it's done, we'll turn off the heat and finish it off with a nice grating of Parmigiano-Reggiano. And we'll stir that in. And our rigatoni a la Genovese is done. So we will go ahead and transfer that into a nice hot pasta bowl. And we'll make sure we have plenty of that sauce. And by plenty, I mean probably too much. And we'll finish that up with one last grating of cheese. And possibly a little more fresh herb for the pictures. Which I took way too many of. But that's okay, I'm a food blogger. But that is why you see me grating on more cheese here. Because it did kind of look like it was sitting around a while. Which it had. So I gave it a little fresh dusting of cheese before I grabbed a fork and went in. And that, my friends, is probably the best meat sauce you've never heard of. I mean, imagine a cross between like a traditional meat sauce, like a bolognese, and a French onion soup. That's kind of the flavor profile here, only better. I mean, it just has to be experienced to be believed. And by the way, if you're one of these I don't like onions lunatics, please, I beg you, try this. I mean, if you like a meat sauce, I don't know how you wouldn't like the sweetness and incredible savoriness all those onions bring to this dish. So if you don't eat onions, I still hope you give this a whirl. And then, of course, admit publicly you've been wrong all these years. And sure, it takes almost a whole day to cook, and you probably won't be able to eat it till the next day. But don't forget, you also get to slice up five or six pounds of raw onions. So you got that going for you. So I really do hope you give this a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Enjoy.